Hi, everyone, and welcome to this new edition of The Analyst with Jake Novak. I'm your host, Jake Novak. And what a difference a couple of weeks makes. The last time we recorded and did an episode of The Analyst, Joe Biden was still in the race. So were a number of other things that were a lot different than they are now. So let's take a look at what I think of the last couple of weeks and what we need to not forget, even though the news cycle continues to offer us so many things that change the equation every single day. But let's take a, 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 a view from 30,000 feet just for a moment. Of course, of course, of course, the big story is that President Biden was removed from the ticket by all accounts. And there are some that are believable and some that aren't. But by all the believable accounts, he was pressured to do so. He was threatened with perhaps the very, very embarrassing threat of a 25th Amendment type situation with the cabinet would rise up and have him removed as his alternative. And so he did finally go, how quietly he went, what other things maybe he and his family extracted in return for his decision to step down, we may never know. But this, of course, is a major watershed moment in American history. And I think it adds to the arguments behind something that I've been saying for a couple of months now about Biden and his cognitive decline. You may remember that I've made the point that his cognitive decline is the biggest political scandal in American history. Is it because so many people have died? Is it because it's the most egregious thing? No, it's because of a couple of factors. First of all, it not only took down a president, which doesn't happen very often, but it took down a president who was in the midst of running for re-election and was pretty darn close in the polls, it, 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 you know, and, and certainly within the margin of error. Unlike Richard Nixon, who was forced out Almost halfway through his second term, he was already arguably a lame duck president or would have been within a couple of months once the congressional elections of 1974 went through. So that's a bigger deal from that standpoint. It's also the biggest scandal because, again, as I've said, it's so simple to understand. Scandals have an inverse relationship to the level of, their, uh, of how complex they are. The more complex the scandal is, the less powerful the scandal is. And the and more simple a scandal is, the more powerful a scandal is. And this was a very simple scandal to understand. Someone going through cognitive decline as the president of the United States, people covering it up. Not only can we understand the facts of it, but a lot of us can really relate to it because we most of us have had someone in our family who's gone through the same thing. So that, I don't wanna ignore that elephant in the room, but the other elephant in the room is the lack of democracy throughout this entire process. Look, especially on a show like The Analyst, we can admire sometimes the cold, clean efficiency of a non-democratic process sometimes. Not that I'm in favor of it, but we can kind of say, boy, no, no must, no fuss with the insertion of Kamala Harris in that role for Joe Biden. But that being said, there were some opportunities that were missed there. They could have gone through something akin to a democratic process. They could have gone to the convention without officially nominating her. And sure, they could have stacked the deck for her there, but at least it would have brought a little bit more suspense and attention to the process. And again, the appearance of propriety, the appearance of being on the up and up about wanting a democratic process. We'll talk a little bit more about that with my first guest when we talk about the vice presidential choice that she made and how that process went about. But folks, understand that the Democratic Party now really since 2012, not that, that there was a big problem with it, but of course in 2012, they had an incumbent in Barack Obama. There was no real campaign or no competition for the Democratic nomination. And then in 2016, there was only a competition in name only because there was no way the DNC was gonna allow Bernie Sanders to win the nomination. And so the deck was stacked for Hillary Clinton. And then in 2020, after briefly thinking and flirting with an open competition for president in their nomination, in their primary process, after Joe Biden's horrific performances in the first two primaries, the I Iowa caucuses to be more precise, and then the New Hampshire primary, they stacked the deck for him, starting with the South Carolina pro primary. And again, the whole democratic process was subverted. So we are dealing again with that one more time, the fact that there was no real democratic process here. And it may not matter for a democratic party that has been working on really a brainwashed public. For all the talk about the people who go to the Trump rallies and how cultish they are, 
what the mainstream media is either lying about or the pundits are either lying about or not are not really seeing is that those people, as brainwashed and cultish as they may be, did that on their own. And they may have brainwashed themselves if that's a, if that's a thing. Those people are true believers. They didn't have to be told to vote for someone and to follow someone. Whether you like Donald Trump or not, you're never going to understand him and the movement if you think that they're just a bunch of sheep who never thought for themselves before. They that's that's really not what they are. And that is unfortunately what I think we have in the Democratic Party. You see it on social media. You see it at the rallies. They could put a ham sandwich up for elections, say that that sandwich isn't Trump, and they would get similar enthusiasm if they asked for it, if they had the applause sign going, if they had the banners for people to wave. And to me, this is really scary. And I would be just as scared by it if I saw it from the Republican side. It's got nothing to do with partisanship here. It's about how in an information age where we have so much at our fingertips and have the ability to more be more independent with our thought processes than ever before, especially when it comes to whom we vote for, we seem to be, at least half the country seems to be totally uninterested in it and totally willing to power it what someone tells them to say. Just think about all the memes that people share on social media from the left and also the right. And think about how quickly those things spread. That doesn't come from independent thought. That comes from people not thinking for themselves. So that's where we are. I don't think it's a really good time in American history that we had this process the way it played out, that we had an inserted president in Joe Biden, who I don't think anyone really actually voted for in 2020. They voted against Donald Trump if they voted for Joe Biden. Replaced without any kind of a democratic process by Kamala Harris, who no one's ever voted for for president in any primary or any potential election either. And it's not really a good thing, even if the Republicans are making up for it in some ways with more democracy than they maybe should. You've heard me say on this program that Donald Trump being so popular no matter how often he has to be fight contest, you know, a contested primary against other Republicans is one thing. But the fact that the Republicans seem to be interested in putting up their own Speaker of the House for a vote every month, a vote of confidence every month or every week, is probably a little too much democracy. Let people have a term in office, things like that. But I would take that any day over the absolute no democracy that at least half the country seems to be OK with right now, even as they talk about how democracy is so precious. It couldn't be a bigger example of cognitive dissonance that, than what you see there. All right, when we come back, I'm gonna be joined by Jim Nuzzo, a guy who has experience in a lot of different fields, politics, medicine, the news media, the law. And we're gonna talk about this entire process of choosing Tim Walls and what it tells you about not only the Harris campaign and the Democrats, but the entire political scene in America. So stick with us on The Analyst. We'll be right back with Jim Nuzzo. Hi, everyone. I'm Veronica Dudo, and welcome to Buy, Hold, Sell. If you have the Russians that are going into Ukraine, the Americans and the Germans and everyone else in Europe is going to say, hell no. If Russia doing things, you know, logically was their M.O., I'd agree with you. Yeah, Todd, why don't you get him on, on a phone call right now? Hello, <laughs> you... I'm Jake Novak, and welcome back to The Analyst with Jake Novak. And we're going to talk now about all of the fascinating aspects of the DNC's decision. And I say that advisedly, not Kamala Harris's decision, the DNC's decision to go with Governor Tim Walls of Minnesota as her running mate, as Kamala Harris's running mate for this presidential election. Now, again, to remind everyone about the, the mission statement of The Analyst is that while we certainly don't claim to be unbiased because no human being is. We aren't here to do a partisan cheerleading or, or, or pound the table in a partisan way. We're here to try to as dispassionately as possible, because it's not easy, but as possible, look at decisions that campaigns make and judge them for their merits and for their demerits <laughs> and their liabilities. And I want to talk about that right now with my next guest, Jim Nuzzo. And Jim Nuzzo is a managing partner of the Colchester Group, but this is someone who has worked in White Houses. He's worked on presidential campaigns. He's been at Nightline, so he has media experience. He also happens to have a medical degree and a law degree. He's you know, really, he's done just about so many different things and he has a lot of important uh, perspectives. And most importantly, he's one of the two or three people who can text and call me at any time to talk about things that have just happened in politics 
and I want to get his thoughts on, and I know he wants to get mine. So he's part of my little inner circle or kitchen cabinet. Jim, thanks for joining us. Um, I, the first question I want to ask you is, were you surprised by the choice of, t of Tim Walls? Because, you know, this, this process seems like it went on forever, but we'll talk in a second about how I don't think it went on forever enough. But were you surprised by his choice, by the choice of him? I think any analyst who tells you that it, he wasn't surprised by it is lying through his teeth. <laughs> uh, what is amazing is the fact that all of the analysts, all of the political pundits, a week before this happened, had their shortlists. And they all wrote the articles that you saw in uh, the news feeds. And Tim Harris, sorry, Tim uh, Walsh was not even mentioned in any of these. It wasn't until the last day. Uh, what I have been told, in addition to the fact that this is an issue that uh, has to do with cementing a way, a segment of the Democratic Party into the Democratic Socialists, but what was really going on was that you may have been watching that the new meme against the Republican ticket is the word weird. Well, the first person who said the word weird was Walsh. And that is what got him on the on the table, if you will, for the vice president and the DNC. And I'll even go one step further, the Obama people. Because when we're talking about the DNC, we're talking about the Obama people. And the Obama people picked up on the word weird. And you've now seen it come out of everyone's mouth. And that's what that one word got him the nomination. You know, Jim, you opened up a, a, a slight tangent that I want to go on just for a second here uh, about the the tone of, Dem of, of the Democratic Party and the way that they act in elections right now. And again, I, I really do say this dispassionately. Um, you'd have to be deaf not to notice that the Democrats enjoy a lot more spice, a lot more saltiness in their candidates and the way that they talk. I think it's a big reason why Gavin Newsom is popular. In addition to him being, you know, conventionally handsome guy, he's nasty. You know, he get he got into those nasty tips with Ron DeSantis over Twitter or other parts of social media a couple of years ago. Um, and again, I say this dispassionately. I think Barack Obama's speeches as president and as a candidate, you will be hard pressed to find even one where he doesn't have a paragraph or two demonizing some person or group, usually a group, un some, sometimes unnamed, in America. He always did that. Now, he did it more elegantly, elegantly than a Donald Trump does it. He did it more elegantly than a Tim Walls or a Gavin Newsom that did it. Absolutely. But he, he, when you think about it, George W. Bush, George H. W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, and even Jimmy Carter never, ever would have done that. It, it, Barack Obama's speeches always had a bad guy or a bad group that he demonized every single time. And I think he opened the door for this. And I think a lot of Democrats liked him because of that, even though they may not have even been cognizant of it. They liked him. Not, and they liked him for other reasons, but they liked him because of that. So I agree with you. I think that Tim Walz got himself in the running that way. But Let's talk about something else just for one second. And that is actually, uh, this is a, a thrust for me. My question about the choice of Tim Walls, before we even talk about him personally, although we already have, before we get any further with him personally, is what was the rush? Every day that the Democrats were in the news because they were in that process of choosing a running mate was a Goldilocks day for the Kamala Harris campaign because it was just enough attention on the campaign and no attention on her personally and her record. It was all about who the choice was gonna be. And that was a great moment. Why did they rush to this? Why not go at least until the, the first day of the convention or right before the convention and use that Goldilocks situation to its extreme? Do you agree with that? Why, do you think that they rushed it and they should have you know, done a little bit more uh, goosing or, or, or grease, <laughs> milking of this opportunity? Well, I'll go one step further. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. But there's one other thing which is very interesting and demonstrates one of the points that you've raised from the beginning, which is this was not a Kamala Harris choice. Kamala Harris, if you look at the history of her spending, both when she was running for senator and when she was running for president, that very brief period of time when she ran for president before uh, Tulsi Gabbard basically sort of beheaded her on stage. If you take a look at the FEC reports, 
She has the highest percentage of spending for oppo research of any candidate that the FEC has, has ever had. This is a woman who lives on oppo research. And we've seen since uh, Walsh has been has been placed into nom nomination for all intents and purposes, uh, the fact that they didn't do the vetting. And this is not something that Kamala Harris and her people don't do. They understand about oppo research. They spend a lot of money on oppo research. How in God's name did they miss the fact that there was a potential for stolen valor? How in God's name did they miss the fact that this guy had a, DW, a DWI? I, I don't understand that. Uh, it, it truly was uh, going to be a, a much longer process. Why do I think it got leaked? Simple. I think that, that Josh Shapiro basically came out and said, I'm taking myself out and had it leaked by his people to the press. And so therefore, they didn't want to have the story that Josh Shapiro said no. They wanted a yes. And the only way in which they could get a yes is by going and rushing the process because Shapiro basically collapsed their timeline. Right. I think, um, and they could, of course, preemptively fix that problem by starting from the beginning and saying, hey, we're going to not announce this until about a day before the convention, which Trump did, by the way. Or they could have done something even smarter, which is an example from history that I bring up a lot of the time that people seem to forget, was that Jimmy Carter went went to the 76 election saying, I will allow the delegates to choose my nominee, which was, you know, interesting. I, I don't know if they, I, you know, I remember that. I don't remember if there was any evidence that the deck was stacked for Walter Mondale because he got it pretty easily. So maybe it was. But still, it was pretty dramatic. It added to some drama. I mean, imagine if the Democrats had chosen to use the whole first day and a half of their convention going through this process with different names going out. They could have stacked the deck for Tim Walls or Josh Vera or anyone they wanted, and they didn't yeah, do that. They, they, they could have, but I think that there's a real fear on the part of the Democrats that what they were going to see in Chicago was a replay of 1968 in Chicago. And they wanted to make certain that the, that what they were going to have was somebody that the agitators on the outside were not going to be against because they didn't want the story to be oh my gosh this is just like 68 look they're having a huge you know intifa is having this huge fight outside uh and the cameras going out there and maybe even a media person being hurt they want this to be an anodyne convention the idea of going and having a convention which was exciting is the last thing they want they want this to be a relatively boring coronation. They had to have it before the nomination convention. Um, let's move on to the stolen valor aspect of it. And I think, first of all, people need to have this clarified. Uh, it's not necessarily about Tim Walls bolting from the National Guard just as he learned that his unit was going to be shipped to Iraq. The reason why I don't think that's the issue is because, let's face it, since Donald Trump's bashing of the Iraq war in 2015, we have reached a consensus in this country among most people that the Iraq war was a mistake. Whether they're right or wrong, we can debate it another time. But that's the consensus now. So a lot of people, I think, would see that and think, eh, I would have done that too. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take uh, that's fine. the issue here. Um, I think the, I, the, the whether he's command master sergeant or master sergeant, He's an E8 or an E9 is something that's going to make people's eyes glaze over. The point that you made at the very beginning, which is the easier it is to understand, the more something becomes powerful in politics. But everyone knows here was a guy whose whose unit was about ready to be shipped off. And he said, yeah, but they shoot real bullets there. <laughs> uh, I think that it's time for me to call it a day. And he left. People may not like the Iraq war. But they don't like the fact of somebody who appears that when the going got tough, he left. And then, as happened with Watergate, which, by the way, today is 50 years from when Richard Nixon resigned. Let's remember that. It's 50 years ago today. It was the cover-up. It wasn't just so much the fact that he, he didn't go. It's that his official biography listed that he went to Afghanistan. He didn't. He has talked on a number of occasions about facing fire. He didn't. He talked about the fact that he was command master sergeant. He wasn't. Uh, 
So again, it's this idea of he's telling untruths. He's trying to take valor. There is a video which is very powerful that just came out yesterday, which is of people from his unit, from his National Guard unit, going into his congressional office in 2009 and confronting him and his team regarding stolen valor. Now, again, pictures mean a heck of a lot more than words. And will he be swift boated by this? Yeah, he's going to be swift boated. Is this going to be huge? Yeah, it's going to be huge. Why? You take a look at that versus you take a look at, and again, let's not be partisan, but let's take a look at the fact that he's trying to create JD um, as someone who is weird. And he's the he's the normal guy. Well, one guy was a Marine. He never said that he faced uh, a firefight, but he was in, in the zone. It, it again, doesn't play but i but we're we're here not to be partisans the issue which really strikes me is this was a self-owned mistake there was no way had she taken an extra day that all of this data would not have been known to her but she didn't she rushed it yeah uh that's where we can agree and, and again I, I you know i think the it's it's not about um, simplifying it from. It's, it's not about him not that, that not going with his unit isn't important, and it is simple. I agree with you. It's just that I would lead with he said he was in combat situations that he wasn't. Then exactly. you explain that further. That's the easiest thing for people to understand, and that's what people need to to hear. It's not really about um, those other things uh, that you know. Again, E eighty nine, all that kind of stuff. You're exactly right. Um, on the rushing of the decision. Uh, there's an aspect of this as well, you know, it's it's interesting, it'd be one thing if Tim Walls had a skeleton in his closet regarding abortion or regarding saying something about taxes. I have a feeling that that, that staff would have caught that even in half a day. You get the feeling that Democrats are in such a bubble that they don't have enough people who would be able to or are even familiar with the lingo. You know, I grew up in Norfolk, Virginia and came to New York as an 11 year old and was shocked that even the smartest kids in my class had no idea what military insignia was. Like they didn't know what a sergeant, you know, what, what, what that meant. They didn't know what a lieutenant's bar is, but they didn't know any of that stuff. I was surprised because they were smart kids. And I get the feeling it's the same thing with this crew here in the Democratic Party, especially the young ones, but maybe even the older ones. They're so not used to military lingo and military life that it wouldn't even occur to them to say, wait a minute, did, did did you not deploy? Is that what a master sergeant is? Those kinds of things. I think they may have been under, I mean, this is what they talk about diversity, diversity, diversity. Well, if it's just about racial diversity and not about intellectual or experiential diversity, these are the kinds of mistakes you can make. Well, yeah, but let's just put aside the stolen valor for a second, because you're right. The issue of the military, it makes it a little bit more complex for an awful lot of people. There's a DWI. There is now a report that's coming out that a federal judge rebuked the state of, of Minnesota and the governor in, in particular regarding a $250,000 fraudulent uh, claims made by a Somali group in Minnesota regarding COVID relief. I mean, these people understand fraud, people understand DWIs. And so therefore, again, this is something which a simple kid who's on his computer for 10 minutes is able to find out why their oppo research people didn't know this. And even if they decided they wanted to go with Governor Walls, why they didn't preempt this and somehow leak it out beforehand so as to make it into old news is mind boggling. Frankly, it's a cell phone. And I, and I don't understand it's a cell phone. I mean, the one thing you got to say for the Obama people, is they don't make self-owned mistakes. And this was one. Yeah, I think that that is, uh, th there's so many mistakes going on here. And again, this is a, a, an overall, overall overarching premise that I've made here on The Analyst many, many times. Political consultants are all bad at what they do. And one of the reasons why, they're, why they get away with it is because even if they have an election that they should win by 25 points, but they only win by one, they get to mark that down as a victory. And so they, they, even the worst of them are often 50-50, uh, 
in their track record. And it just, it, 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 it masks people to realities. Listen, folks, DNC Kamala Harris, if you're listening, you know, focus on me right now because I have some advice for you. Thomas Eagleton. Now, I know you lost the 1972 election in a historic landslide to Richard Nixon. As many of you know, George McGovern, Thomas Eagleton was his running mate for a hot second. Then news came out about how he had been given shock therapy as a mental patient. Again, I don't think that would be such a huge deal today, but it certainly was back in 72. It would be a big deal today, too, but it was bigger back then. They replaced him with Sergeant Shriver. And you might say, well, replacing him didn't help. Au contraire. Take a look at the 1972 election results. Richard Nixon, despite getting well over 500 electoral college votes, had no coattails. There was absolutely no real significant difference in the House and Senate elections. So I would advise you at this point to replace Tim Walls. I would do it by Friday because, again, it may not save you and Kamala, but it will potentially save a lot of your congressional candidates because if this gets out and to more people, it's already, get, it's already gotten out, but if this continues to grow, and I think it should because this level of soul and valor to me is really offensive. If this continues to percolate as it has, and CNN opened the door for it, their own reporter, Tom Foreman, was the one who focused on the combat stuff not being true. So they can't put that genie back in the bottle. Think about what happened with Thomas Eagleton, and don't forget that while you lost that presidential election badly, you held on to your congressional majorities for the most part, just as they were the day before. Don't forget about that. Last thoughts from Jim Nuzzo. Uh, I'm again going to take a little bit of, a, of another take, take from you. Sure. Kamala Harris has basically been a blank slate. The first thing that she's done that we know of, really wasn't true, but that the people know of, was the selection of her running mate. If now she says, oops, I need to do a redo, that's a very bad thing. I mean, Richard, I mean, the one thing about McGovern when Richard Nixon was running against McGovern, McGovern had been a senator for decades. His position was well known. Everyone understood who McGovern was and whether you were going to vote for him or vote against him, you knew who he was. And Eagleton, therefore, wasn't a big hit. If Kamala Harris's one and only decision that is in the public interest or the public domain, I should say, is the selection of her running mate and she says, uh, mistake a race, let's do this again, that I think would be just beyond question. Now, you're right. It may save down ticket but it will absolutely destroy any chance she has of, of, the, of the presidency. Yeah, I, I think she doesn't have a chance anyway, but I think I think it's going to be a close election no matter what. So that's that's one of those things. But anyway, Jim Nuzzo, managing partner at the Colchester Group, thanks for joining us. When we come back, we're going to talk about the other elephant in the room when it comes to this decision about Tim Walls. And I call it the Shapiro affair because there are a lot of things about it that remind me of the Dreyfus Affair, and we're going to focus on the anti-Semitism that has been unmasked for those of you who haven't been looking. I think everyone else saw it. But the anti-Semitism aspect of this and what that means beyond just this presidential election. We'll be right back with Jason Eskin from the South Five Group in just a moment. Ready to up your game and learn more about the thrilling world of sports betting? Introducing Double Down with Breslow, the ultimate podcast about the business of sports gambling. Join me, James Breslow, and a long list of expert guests as we dive into the art and science of the sports betting industry. Evolving regulations, technology enhancements, and the meteoric rise in the number of players makes this sector the fastest growing and most intriguing in the world. Unlock the business secrets from many of the industry's most recognizable C-suite executives, including famous odds makers and influencers. Every episode of Double Down with Breslow is packed with insider tips, deeply skilled analysis, and in-depth discussions. Don't miss out on the ultimate resource for mastering the business of sports betting. Listen to Double Down with Breslow on the Evergreen Podcast Network or wherever you listen to podcasts. That's Double Down with Breslow, the business of sports betting podcast. Welcome back to The Analyst with Jake Novak. I'm your host, Jake Novak. And I wanted to talk a little bit about my background first before we focus on the other aspect of the Tim Waltz choice. Some of you may know this, some of you may not. Um, of course, it says on my resume that I spent a couple of years working for the Israeli consulate. But beyond that, again, this is only something that I would share because, not because I'm not very proud of it, but just because it's apropos to our forthcoming discussion. Uh, 
I also grew up in a very traditional religious Jewish family. I went to yeshiva and day schools my entire life, even though I also went to a secular university and a secular graduate school. And that is really why I have a little bit more of an interest, a personal interest in when people talk about things like the Jewish vote, which I put in quotes, and I'll explain why in a little bit later, and what I think happened with Josh Shapiro and the decision not to go with him as a vice presidential candidate. There's an interesting thing about growing up in a religious Jewish community and going to Jewish day school. You learn a lot of history because the Jews have played such a huge role in Western history. So it's not like you don't get a lot of Western history. And of course, once you get into a high school situation to get state accreditation, you have to still <laughs> teach basic history. But one of the events in history that you could learn in a secular high school and learn in a Jewish high school is of course, something called the Dreyfus Affair. Now, for those of you who don't know what the Dreyfus Affair is about, it actually stretched through 12 years of French history, 1894 until its final resolution in 1906. But basically what happened, and these are all agreed upon facts, this is not opinion here. Basically what happened is that the French military was hit badly by an espionage scandal. Some very sensitive material about the French military was handed over to the Germans. And even though World War I wouldn't start for another 20 years between 1894 and 1914, it was already starting in really even the 1880s. It was clear that France and Germany were at odds over many, many political and military issues. And so this was a huge scandal. Now, as soon as it came to light, people in the French military decided to pin the scandal, decided to pin the treachery on a captain who was in a sensitive position, he wasn't just a, a field commander, on a captain named Alfred Dreyfus, who happened to be Jewish. He was tried and imprisoned. And then not long afterwards, a French journalist named Emile Zola wrote a scandalous front page article showing that Dreyfus was just being framed because he was a Jew. And he was being used to cover up a major problem within the French military. It was later found that the espionage was real. There wasn't anything un untrue about the actual espionage in incident. It was just that Dreyfus was completely innocent. It turned out that a French officer who was having an affair with a German es a spy handed over that information to his lover, another man in the German army. And that's how that information changed hands. Now, it wasn't just because, now again, if you learn this like I did in a Jewish day school or even in a secular school, you probably only learned about how the Dreyfus affairs affect, affected the Jewish world and the movement of Zionism. In other words, you learn that that overt example of anti-Semitism that was finally exposed by Zola woke up millions of European Jews to the reality of Europe, to the fact that there was still tremendous anti-Semitism, but the fact that even though they were citizens in most of the countries of Europe, they were never really uh, equal citizens. And it helped put a real shot in the arm into modern Zionism. Zionism had, of course, existed for thousands of years, but it gave a real shot in the arm to modern Zionism. And a lot of people say that that was a watershed event. And that's how you learn about it. And all that is true. But what, I, what I'm upset about, and I remain, I'm upset about it then, and I'm, and I'm upset about it now, is that it leaves out an even bigger fact for, for at least more a wider group of people was that it actually led to the downfall of colonial France. It was not just the espionage and the fact that some of that information got into the hands of the Germans. It was the anti-Semitism scandal that led to a distrust of the French ruling class. And what it had been at the time, you know, we make a lot of jokes about the French military now, but in 1890s, they were one of the most respected militaries in the world. And they were a colonial power. And their anti-Semitism was absolutely a huge role in what began a long running decline of France all the way until World War II when France really began to fall off the map completely as anything considered anything close to a power. So in other words, anti-Semitism destroyed France. The Dreyfus Affair destroyed France. It was a slow destruction. It was a slow boil, but it happened. Okay, why am I talking about this now? Because the one thing we left out in our previous segment about the decision to go with Tim Walls was the, the elephant in the room of anti-Semitism. It is completely fair to say, not only based on your own logic, but on some internal reports, that anti-Semitism and the fears of the anti-Semitic wing of the Democratic Party played the key role in Kamala Harris and the DNC not choosing Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro as her running mate. Anti-Semitism played a key role in it because almost all the other factors were very much in his favor, not the least of which being Pennsylvania being the number one key swing state in this, in this election and Shapiro being at least somewhat popular there and certainly able with the infrastructure at the hands of a governor 
an ability to hand Pennsylvania on a silver platter for, for Harris, or at least make it a lot easier for her to win. And so they bowed to the far left regressive. I don't like to call them progressive because anti-Semitism, going back to anti-Semitism and communism is regressive, not progressive. But the anti-Semitic regressive wing of the party won that and won that battle and then brought her to this point where she has this disastrous, I think disastrous choice in Tim Walls. And it seems to be getting more disastrous by the day. I want to bring in my next guest now to talk about what this means, not only for the Paris campaign, not only for this, what I call the Shapiro affair, but the wider effects of the Shapiro affair with Jason Epstein. He is the president of South Five Strategies. He's been a guest on The Analyst before. Jason, I did a whole long preamble there. I know I did that and I apologize. But I want to get your take on what you think about that. Do you think it's as big? I, I think that this is a scandal. And I think this is a scandal that could destroy the Harris campaign, not unlike the Dreyfus campaign, woke up Jews. Looks like I think this is waking up some Jews and also destroyed France. It's a very uh, persuasive argument, Jake. Uh, by the way, thank you uh, for bringing me uh, on the program. It's a pleasure. It's 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 persuasive. I don't know if I would say it's it would ultimately be on par because France was rocked by the Dreyfus affair and France was very divided. But media media back in the day uh, managed to uh, penetrate both sides. I don't uh, I don't see that happening here quite so easily. Um, Right now, yes, there there are real there are real concerns about how this uh, how this decision came down, and what's very interesting is, you know, you when you had me on last time, we talked a little bit about uh, J D Vance had not yet been picked. It was only two or three days uh, before the selection had been made. It was right before the assassination attempt on the on uh, former President Trump, and the point I had made. Uh, ironically, by suggesting it might be Doug Burgum, is compatibility. I I, I push the compatibility argument as uh, perhaps one of the more um, uh, one of the more uh, one of the reasons why a presidential candidate would choose a running mate like a Doug Burgum. Uh, it turns out that Trump chose J.D. Vance, but probably for. Uh, compatibility reasons as much as any other. You could have said, if you were in the Harris campaign, you could have made an argument that maybe Josh Shapiro wasn't compatible or wasn't quite so compatible. But I don't understand what Waltz brings in terms of that compatibility. It's not even clear that they have spent any time in the same room together. Um, when we were talking compatibility, back in the last interview, maybe I had said uh, Governor Cooper of North Carolina would be a compelling pick, particularly because uh, he and Harris, when they were both state attorneys general, had done a little bit of work together. They had gotten along. It was known. Okay. So you could, you could still make the argument that compatibility is part of this. But the fact that the Harris campaign, let alone the candidate herself, never pushed back against the against the onslaught against Governor Shapiro, against Josh Shapiro, uh, that sort of uh, that sort of exposes what was going on here. That, of course, it was it was about his it was about his uh, Judaism, the fact that he is a practicing Jew, uh, the fact that. Uh, while he may have been very critical of Prime Minister Netanyahu of late, uh, he has a long history with uh, the state of Israel, with uh, pro-Israel groups, very well known. Yes, it, it it it's pretty it's it's pretty out there. And I was listening to to Jim Nuzzo in the previous segment. Um, I was listening to your your comments as well. And yes, I, I, I agree 100%. Chicago, Chicago would have been, if you can believe this, more dangerous than ever uh, during the convention if Shapiro had been the nominee. Yeah, that's that says a lot. I think um, there's a couple of things here that, again, I, I feel comfortable saying because not only did I grow up in a, in a, in a traditional Jewish home, but I went to yeshiva. A couple of things that you know from history that we can say from history. 
you know, Josh Shapiro still showed up at that rally on Monday introducing Tim Walls. And I'm not saying people should pout and run in a corner. But during that rally, he talked about how he was still proud of his heritage. And I'm sorry, I have to take issue with that. I think that he was not only not proud of his heritage to still play, play a part in this, in this charade, but I don't really know if he has much respect for himself. There's a difference between someone who has a lot of ambition and someone who has a very high opinion of themselves. Sometimes it's not actually the same thing. I don't think Josh Shapiro has enough respect for himself because he just went through a process where he lost out on something that would have put him in a national prominent position because he was Jewish and he was still willing to cheerlead the candidate and the party that did this to him. And I just think that, you know, again, this is like a, a, a divorced wife cheering on, you know, who, who wanted to stay married. <laughs> it's not someone who was unhappy, cheering on the wedding of, uh, of her ex-husband with, with the woman who, you know, cheated on her with him. I think that that has a lot to do with it. So that to me, yeah, that, that really can't be um, excused. It's a political thing. Listen, politicians we know act like prostitutes sometimes, but this was a bridge too far, I think. And I think it weakens uh, an ability he would have had had he stayed away to, to maybe even make a, a big victory out of this for himself and say, listen, I'm not going to say anything negative about the campaign now, but I will give you my thoughts after the election. And then he could really make a point of trying to take a, a bigger role in the party. A fair point. Uh, Shapiro, look, Shapiro has uh, has tried to sort of uh, duck and weave as best as he can because what's going on inside his party is, uh, I, I'm sure that that he is is very ashamed of what's happening. But he has his sights on either 2028 or 2032, probably. It, in his heart, he probably, and in his brain too, I might add, probably thinks it's going to happen sooner in 2028. And so he probably is willing to mortgage a little, uh, a little integrity right now uh, with the hope that this is, that, that the fact that he was the runner up, the fact that he was, uh, he was under serious consideration and for, for uh, a not insignificant time, the favorite, uh, this is what this he, he is he is looking past this um and i agree with the sentiment that i don't think he even want frankly i don't even think he he necessarily wanted to be the running mate um i did a little research uh not long ago and you have to go back to franklin delano roosevelt when he was on the losing ticket in 1924 to find a number two on a losing ticket who went on to become president uh, and here he doesn't have to walk back any uh, additional issues. He can be himself now. He he made his comments uh, before uh, before Waltz uh, was introduced, and now he can you know he, he can if he wants to campaign for the ticket he can do that solo. He doesn't have to do it with with uh, with Harris, and he does certainly doesn't have to do it with Waltz. Uh, I think it's also interesting, Jake. Um, you know, there are uh, there are folks like Phil Klein of National Review. Uh, I'm not sure if Ben Shapiro falls into this category, but those who 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 are actually relieved that he wasn't chosen, and I think you were starting to hint hint at that in your in 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 your comments just before that what would have happened if he had been on the ticket? Would that have been sort of a lifeline for the anti semites, just like Doug Emhoff? Kamala Harris's husband is is the is he's Jewish, so of course she 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 must be pro-Israel on on every issue. Uh, similarly, I mean Josh Josh Shapiro is the running mate. Uh, would have had to back whatever Harris or whatever issues had come up regarding regarding Israel and 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 the fight in Gaza and perhaps war with Iran with the Iranian regime. Yeah, no, I, uh, it's funny. I want to clarify something that I said earlier in the week where I said the same thing you did. There certainly is some aspect of relief to this because the, the biggest reason what you just mentioned just now, having him on the ticket may have given Kamala Harris a free pass to uh, explore even further anti-Israel policies, no doubt about it. But that's, that's just basically saying this is one thing that we dodged. But it's not good for the Jews, not good news for the Jews that someone was passed over because of his Judaism. In other words, we can be relieved that this negative scenario isn't now going to happen. 
But we have to acknowledge the fact that this completely takes the curtain away from a very ugly situation. You know, let's, I, I started the segment going back 130 years to 1894 in the beginning of the Dreyfus Affair. Let's go back just 24 years ago when Al Gore chose Joseph Lieberman, not only a Jew, but an Orthodox Jew as his running mate. And not only was there no pushback from the Democrats on that, but there were a lot of Republicans who said, oh, my aunt is still going to vote for him, but we, you know, we respect that guy. And mm -hmm. now here we are 24 years later, really just less than a generation later, and the mere, mere dem the, the, uh, the idea of putting a Jew at all on the ticket is, is considered to be toxic because of a, of a growing power within the party. Absolutely. And it just it just makes us understand that the chalice was poisoned uh, long before Waltz was picked. Uh, it was during the selection process. And since you brought up Joe Lieberman, we can we can uh, we can remind everyone that in 2006, effectively, uh, the party kicked him out um, in, in, in no small part because of his his views on Israel and how Israel should be able to defend itself and how the U.S. should be able to, uh, you know, to to uh, conduct its its uh, Middle East policy. Uh, in addition, of course, school choice was always a a a, a big issue. But you know, this is this has been this has been something that has been brewing for a long time. It's been percolating, and it's. I'm sure you still have one or two. Uh, friends on the left, it is becoming increasingly impossible to have a conversation uh, with them to get them to to at least acknowledge what is taking place in their midst. And the ones who do acknowledge, uh, they become Republicans, or at least they 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 will not vote for this for this Democrat ticket. Yeah, I, I, you know, again, because it's 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 a strategy show. I want to take it beyond just political strategy and talk about this includes political strategy, but it's also a strategy for life. Let me let me give everyone watching a little bit of advice based on many many years of history, and you may think it's completely biased, but believe me, the facts back me up. Anti-Semitism makes you stupid, no matter how accomplished or powerful you might be. The list of nations and individuals who have ruined their careers, ruined their fortunes, ruined their power because they succumbed to anti-Semitism is long. Tsarist Russia, Soviet Russia, Nazi Germany, the, the Romans, you know, it, it, the list goes on and on. And it talks about, about some individual people that we're seeing right now. Tucker Carlson, Candace Owens, uh, you know, uh, whatever, Ye or Kanye West, whatever you want to call him, all right? It makes you stupid. It ruins a lot of things. And if the Democratic Party is going to succumb to anti-Semitism now, look what it's already wrought for you. It's wrought you a very problematic running mate for Kamala Harris, whose stolen valor issue is becoming a bigger and bigger deal day after day, in addition to the fact that he won't be able to deliver PA as easily as Shapiro could have. So this stuff makes you stupid, folks. It's not just a bad political strategy. It's a bad strategy for life. And it's not just about you. There's a lot of other kind of bigotry that will get you. But there's a little bit more history behind that last statement. And people should understand this. If you are a Democrat and you think it's OK, if you're going to be Josh Shapiro about this and still cheerlead and be a part of the team, I got to tell you, you're going down with the Titanic on this one. Well said. And 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 I would just I would just add, you know, for the longest, for, you know, eventually it catches it catches up. I mean, it caught up to Cory Bush. It caught up to Jamal Bowman. It'll catch up to others as well. And. And uh, yes, as, as I said at the outset, it's true that that it's difficult for messages to to get through. Um, the media, the legacy media, they still have control over many of the levers. X X is is decentralized. X is a is a godsend. We should be we should be grateful. But eventually, the truth comes out. And accuracy and and accuracy is is noted, and it for a time it looked like Biden was never going to Biden was never going to be exposed um, to the rest of America, and sure enough, eventually it happened, and I think you know when 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 the time comes, 
she, uh, she meaning Kamala Harris, will have to answer questions about Israel and answer them in ways that are just not, I am speaking, and she will have to uh, speak and either denounce those those uh, you know have a sister soldier moment and denounce these 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 freaks inside her party, or she uh, she will lose. Uh, she will certainly lose. And so the the hope the so the hope is that it happens sooner as opposed to later, but it will happen. Yeah. I would just conclude by saying that, folks, anti-Semitism is on the ballot in this election. You have one party that's decided to kowtow to it and maybe even embrace it. There's really no other way to say it. And if your hatred of Donald Trump is something that overcomes your decision to recognize the anti-Semitism from the other party, then that is certainly your choice. But don't pretend it's about anything else. You've decided that that hatred is more important than you recognizing anti-Semitism. And you know, just be honest about it is all, all I can ask. Jason Epstein is the president of South Five Strategies. Thank you again for joining us and thank everyone else for joining us here on The Analyst with Jake Novak. As you know, you really can't miss an episode of this show because things really, really change quickly. For all we know, we'll have three different candidates by the time uh, we tape again next week. But I appreciate your time. Until next time on The Analyst, I'm Jake Novak. Thanks for watching.